Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Ten years ago, that's July 23rd, 2002, the British cabinet met to discuss the possible war against Iraq. The then head of MI6, the head of British intelligence, briefed Prime Minister Blair and the cabinet, and when asked about what evidence there was that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, amongst other things, he said, quote, the intelligence and facts are being fixed around the policy. That, as we know now, became the famous Downing Street memo when the minutes of this meeting were leaked, and it became clear, unlike what the Bush administration was saying, and what President, Ch I should say President Cheney, but I guess it's Vice President Cheney, was saying on Sunday morning show after show for years, and continues to say without any challenge from mainstream media, that all the foreign intelligence agencies around the world that we work with agreed with us about this. Well, in fact, the Downing Street memo made it clear that British intelligence had serious doubts about the intelligence, told Prime Minister Blair all of this. Now the question is, are we seeing all of this again? When it comes to Iran, are we seeing another set of facts fit around a policy? Now joining us to talk about all of this are two people that are, have been part of this world of intelligence analysis for many years. First of all, joining us from Dusseldorf, Germany, Annie Machon was an intelligence officer at UK's MI5 from 1991 to 1996. She resigned as a whistleblower. She's now a writer, a media commentator, and an activist. And now also joining us from our studio in Washington is Ray McGovern. Ray was a CIA analyst for 27 years. He prepared the presidential daily briefing under the Nixon and Ford administrations, and, uh, and he continued to serve under other administrations. He now joins us from our office in Washington. Ray, why don't you kick us off, first of all, a, a little bit about the significance of this day, 10 years after the Downing Street Mount, uh, meeting. Well, Paul, it's very, very interesting background here. We're talking eight months before the war in Iraq. July 23rd, 2002, before March 19th, 2003. Uh, even before that, uh, almost 12 months before the war, Tony Blair had gone to Crawford, Texas, and uh, said, yes, I agree. If you want to be the first war president of the 21st century, I want to be the first war prime minister of the 21st century. And they kept talking for, oh, every week, according to the press, since April of 2002. But talking on the phone really just doesn't do it on matters of this consequence. And so what we saw Tony Blair do was send his chief of intelligence, Sir Richard Birloff, uh, uh, to, uh, to Washington to talk with his counterpart, George Tenet. It's much better to get a first-hand view of this. And, and Tenet resisted this. Uh, and finally he was told by the White House, no, you have to see Sir John Birloff. And so he did on a Saturday, and that was the 20th of July, three days before the, the famous Downing Street meeting and minutes. What did uh, Tennant say? Well, he was the typically garrulous tenant. Uh, he was pretty, pretty well advised to be skeptical of the chance to, to meet with dear love because he was afraid he'd say too much, and indeed he did. And what he said was this, because we have this from dear love, and I quote, this is the Downing Street memos prepared by a participant on the same day. Dear Love reported on his recent talks in Washington, military action was now seen as inevitable. Bush wanted to remove Saddam through military action justified by the conjunction of terrorism and WMD. Translation will say that Saddam has all manner of WMD and that he's going to give it to terrorists. And then the kicker, but the intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. Now, that is the, that is the cardinal sin of intelligence work, when you shape the facts around the policy. And so, right from the outset, it was clear to the British that there was no evidence for a war, but that since George Bush had decided to do it, and Tony Blair wanted to be right along with him, they would fix the facts and the intelligence around the policy. We know the consequences of that decision. Just to think about these men, I call them men, the sirs, you know, the Sir John Dearlove and so forth. <laughs> you know, Man. these aren't my, I, 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 I hesitate to think what my Irish grandmother would say, sir this, sir that. 
if that society excuse me they're a bunch of punks plotting wars that was where they are and they're honored graciously at the end of their service with knighthood whatever. well that's my question annie uh, annie have any of the people involved in this now we know this essentially was manufactured not essentially was manufactured evidence uh, have any of the people involved in that meeting responsible that helped create a war uh, and a war Kofi Annan called illegal but of course it took him a year afterwards to say that have anyone suffered any consequences to of all of this well of course millions of Iraqis have no I mean the people in involved the UK yeah. establishment has suffered anything um, in fact what we saw was Sir Richard Dearlove retiring with bloated with honors and he was the head of uh, Cambridge College as a reward and his successor was a man called uh, John Scarlett who at the time of this build up to the Iraq war was the head of the Joint Intelligence Committee in London, and he was the man who was responsible for involved from the two dossiers that allowed the UK to join the US in its invasion into Iraq. Uh, we're talking about the September dossier from 2002, which included um, the famous claim that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction which could be launched within 45 minutes. Um, so then we had screaming headlines in all the UK media saying the UK was 45 minutes from doom, 45 minutes from Armageddon. And it also included fake intelligence that Saddam's regime was trying to gain uh, yellow cake, Iranian, from Nile. And this was based, based on forged documents. And it, Sir John Scarlett actually signed off on that. He also signed off on what became known as the Dodgy Dossier, which was published in February 2003, which was based not only on yes. a 12 year old PhD thesis, which was culled off the internet, the but also, also included some um, new warrants which hadn't been cleared for dissemination. So we have a situation where these two um, men were responsible for the intelligence that allowed the UK government to go into the Iraq war. So John Dearlove took the rap for those dodgy dossiers when there was an inquiry into it. But his reward for that, rather than being held to account, his reward was to be given the head of MI6. He became chief spook in the UK. And he, again, he was given a knighthood. So nobody is ever held to account. They are dishonorable men who have been unfairly and unrightly and unjustly honored. So Ray, Ray uh, you and Annie have just co-authored a piece. Uh, in fact, you can, if people can read it on the Real News Network. We've published it on our homepage, which says that this could be all happening again, this time the target being Iran. Uh, why do you think that? Well, the essence of it, Paul, is that uh, these are all honorable men, all honorable men uh, out of Shakespeare here. And we have yet another such man, uh, Sir John Sawyers, who is the new head of British intelligence, and he is saying unusual things. For example, on the 4th of July, he said that uh, Iran was prevented from getting a nuclear weapon, which they would already have had in uh, 2008, by the intrepid efforts of my organization, MI6. Secondly, even so, Iran is likely to get a nuclear weapon in two years. Now, <laughs> let's forget the first one. That's uh, bravado. Uh, the second one is not shared by U.S. intelligence, nor British intelligence, as far as we knew up till now. The judgment has always been, since late 2007, that Iran has not yet decided whether it would go for a nuclear weapon, and there is no intelligence evidence to prove that they have reinstituted the nuclear weapons program that they stopped at the end of 2003. So how do you square what, uh, what the new SIR is saying, the new head of MI6, with what most intelligence agencies, especially the American, but also the Israeli, to be sure, and also the, the British intelligence agencies say? The, uh, the situation in the Persian Gulf vis-a-vis -vis Iran is more more perilous than it has been in years. And here we have the head of British intelligence warning without any evidence that Iran is going to get a nuclear weapon in two years. That's shameless. Uh, Annie, Russia, China, they have joined in on uh, a certain level of the sanctions against Iran. Uh, I mean, one would think these various intelligence services are providing their governments with some kind of information that would lead them to, to agree to sanctions. Uh, what do you make of that? And, and, then, uh, and then what Ray is saying, that you, you know, uh, is British intelligence cooking something up again? I mean, how do you, where, where do you draw the line as an analyst of what seems to be being cooked up, what's not public? We've got the intelligence estimates from the Americans, which seem to 
contradict what the Israelis are saying. The IAEA keeps hinting at something, but without any smoking gun. Uh, how do you sort all this out? Well, I think we've been here before because, as Ray says, the uh, national intelligence estimate, all 16 of the U.S. intelligence agencies in 2007, came to the same conclusion, which is that Iran had no nuclear capability, had stopped in 2003, and had no intention of restarting it. And this, at the time, was um, quite unexpected, I think, for the U.S. administration, because they were um, beginning to draw a war against Iran, and suddenly they'd lost the pretext. And I'm concerned, because in the U.K., uh, MI6 historically has been the, one of the most secretive organizations. Um, it, it has existed for over 100 years. And the head of MI6, uh, Sir John Sawyer's, who is actually, uh, his acronym is C, terribly mysterious, Sir John Sawyer's speech um, like 10 days ago has broken his historical precedent because we have a situation over 100 years of MI6's history where the head of MI6 has never gone on the public record. Now, Sawyer's made one public speech to a very select audience two years ago where he was talking about the general principles of intelligence. However, this is alarming because not only was he bragging about operational matters, um, you know, MI6 stopped the acquisition of the bomb by Iran in 2008, we're actually looking at a situation where he is again commenting on political issues, such as the fact that Iran will have a bomb in two years. And I think that the fact that he is now speaking up, and he won't be speaking independently, he will have permission and clearance from his political masters, one hopes, to say this, either they are trying to fabricate, again, a case for war, just as MI6 did in the run-up to the Iraq war, or that they are perhaps being used as useful sock puppets or mouthpieces um, to start the ball rolling, and then other intelligence agencies from other countries can then pick it up and run with it. And right. either way, it's not looking good for the Iranians. And Ray, while there's the rhetoric for war continues and perhaps heats up, uh, there's something real, uh, a warfare already going on, that's economic warfare through the sanctions. And, and I've always thought there's a bit of a, a good cop, bad cop going on in the sense that if you keep the rhetoric for war going, yes, it leaves that door open, but somehow makes sanctions look okay, reasonable compared to war. Whereas there's still, I mean, if there's no evidence there's a weapons program, what's the basis for the sanctions? Well, the sanctions are, in a very real sense, an act of war particularly the very stringent sanctions that have just been laid on Iran. And besides that, you have all manner of covert action activities, assassination of Iranian scientists, blowing up of Iranian generals for the missile program, for all manner of things going on inside Iran. And we know that $400 million was appropriated by our Congress in early 2008 to pursue precisely those things. So there is a state of war. There is a state of war already with Iran. And the question is how much, uh, how much it will go further uh, before Iran decides to do something. The situation in the Gulf, as I alluded to before, is really perilous. Uh, there is no communication between the navies of uh, the U.S., U.K., other allied forces that are in the Gulf for clogging it up. And, uh, and so the, the prospect of an incident happening, whether, whether a provocation or whether an accident, is very, very clear and very, very real. So one would think that if one wanted to prevent a war, they would at least set up a secure line of communication, a hotline, or an agreement on incidents at sea, such as we had with the Soviet Union. But nobody seems to be interested in that, even Well, I think the, the objective clearly is regime change, not, not, not anything else, whether it's through that economic warfare or by other means. Well, of course, we've seen regime change by Western forces. I mean, the 1953 overthrow of the democratically elected President Mossadegh um, to be replaced by a uh, Western puppet, the Shah, to allow the, the oil contract to be flowing. So um, history seems to be doomed to repeat itself, and we seem doomed to be making the same mistakes over and over again. And of course, it's going to be the people of Iran who suffer the most. Okay, thank you both for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.